Revenge films. My wife messed up. Big time. The other day her dad took out a loan for his business. And she made me a joint guarantor without telling me. She even forged my signature. I found out about all of this when I got an invoice from a company I've never heard of. I asked my wife about it, then. Don't you remember? I asked you if he could be my dad's joint guarantor the other day. You said yes. What? I didn't know such thing. I knew her dad owned a business. He got it from his mother. The company was doing well at first, but in recent years, sales were beginning to go down. His mother, my wife's grandmother, was pretty good at running a business, but her dad, not so much. I didn't know much about running a business, but even I could tell he was doing something wrong. And now he wanted to borrow more money? With me as the joint guarantor? Hell no! It's not hard to imagine what's gonna happen. So I said no when she asked me. I made myself pretty clear. But they did it anyways! In the mail I got, there was a copy of the original contracts. It was clearly not my handwriting. I went to see her dad right away. He's got some balls, I'll give him that. Making me his joint guarantor without telling me? But when I told him that I was ready to bring the cops into all this, he snapped back at me. You are gonna snitch on your father-in-law? You should have just said yes in the first place! For me, it was like being asked to invest money into a sinking ship. But for some reason, I was the bad guy ahead. Then my wife. Yeah, we're family! We're supposed to help each other out! It's your fault! Why the hell would I help him? The business is going under! And I'm not kidding. I'm going to the police! Then she started crying. Her father said, Stop treating me like a criminal! You're useless, but I let you marry my daughter anyways! Um, no. The moment you forged my signature, you guys committed a crime. Plain and simple. But my wife didn't admit it, and her father didn't seem to realize the severity of the situation either. Talking to them was really exhausting. I decided to call it a day. I'm gonna go see a lawyer tomorrow. But I've never hired a lawyer before. I had no idea where to start. I thought about calling my parents, but if I get them involved in this, that'll just make things more complicated. I decided to talk to some friends about it. One of them introduced me to a lawyer. According to him, it wasn't going to be easy proving that the signature was forged. They said not to involve the cops in this. But the lawyer said there was no other choice. Then I found out something even more shocking. My wife and I lived in an apartment. But we were saving up for our own place. But my wife used that money too to help out her dad. I couldn't trust her anymore. And now I was completely broke. I was panicking. I decided to go talk to her. She was hiding at her parents' house. Her dad yelled at me. It's the least you can do! Stop whining! Once the business gets back on track, I'll be able to make that back in no time! And my wife said. If I told you, you would have said no! Well, of course! We've been saving for our own place for so long now! I can't believe it's all gone now! I was furious. To break stuff, but I didn't want to give them anything that would help them in court. So I held in my anger. Until all of this, we were just a normal couple. Nothing out of the ordinary. But now, I was starting to think about the worse. The thing is, her dad's business is going south sooner or later. I tried explaining to her that when that happens, I'm gonna end up with all the debt. But. It's okay! Dad said so! There was just no talking to her. How can he be so confident? He's the reason the company's been losing business for years! We need a miracle or two to get the company back on track. Meanwhile, the lawyer found out something interesting. I thought my wife forged my signature. But according to the test results, it wasn't her handwriting. The only person left was my father-in-law. But turns out, he threatened one of his employees and made him force my signature. He was the spending type and borrowed money from his company from time to time. He used this to blackmail him, telling him if he didn't go to the bank and do as he said, he'd tell his wife about all of it. So, he obeyed, went to the bank, and filled out the application on my behalf. When he heard about my lawsuit, he got scared and came forward. He told my lawyer everything. He 
begged him, saying, Please don't tell my wife about the dead! Needless to say, the lawyer didn't listen. He may have been under pressure, but he still forged my signature and took out a loan under my name. He's gonna pay for what he did. Now I had enough proof, according to the lawyer. And the thing is, I wasn't the only one now. They now had to worry about the bank suing them too. A few days later, I went to see my wife and her father with my lawyer. He finally gave up and said he'd sell the company to pay me back. He begged me to withdraw my lawsuit. That was fine by me. As long as I got my money back, I didn't really care. And this company was going under anyways. I'm surprised that it lasted this long in the first place. But what surprised me even more was the fact that my wife pretended like nothing happened. Seriously? You think we can just start over? After what you did to me?! She seemed surprised when I told her that. She really thought it wasn't that big of a deal, she said. What? No! Are you leaving me? I could no longer trust her. And I can't be with someone who I can't trust. When I told her that, she started crying. But I didn't really feel anything. I mean, did she really expect me to just forget about all of this? When I tried to explain to her what would happen if her dad failed to pay off the debt, all she said was, We'll figure it out! Don't worry! I don't think she quite understands how things work in the real world. I should have realized this earlier. A few days later, I handed her the divorce papers. Why? Why do we have to get a divorce? She started flipping out again. I guess she really doesn't understand what she did. I was too tired to deal with her, so I hired that lawyer again to deal with all of this. We told her parents that if she didn't agree to the divorce, we were ready to go to trial again. Finally, she agreed and signed the papers. She fought me until the very last minute. But I'm glad I went through with her. Who knows what kind of trouble I would have ended up in if I gave up and stayed with her. After the divorce, I moved out. I wanted to get away from her as soon as possible. Thanks to the lawyer, I was no longer in debt and I got all my money back. So I had more than enough money. I heard she's living with her parents now. Apparently, she now blames her parents for the divorce. She says if it wasn't for them, she'd still be married to me. A mutual friend told me that she was still trying to contact me. But I had no idea because I blocked her on everything. I'm just glad I had good friends and a good lawyer to help me through all of this. If it wasn't for them, who knows what could have happened. The company was in terrible shape. If I hadn't noticed in time, I would have ended up in so much debt. Never want to see my ex-wife or her family again. Time to move on with my own life. There was this gross guy at my college named Timothy. Timothy was already working and he decided to come to college when he was 42 years old. He always wanted to be part of the college girls groups and I have no idea where he gets his information, but he would invite himself to gatherings at bars when they were having a girls night out. There were times when he even tried to invite himself over to the girls houses and was shooed off. It wasn't like he dressed creepy or anything, but it wasn't like he was a handsome man. Just your ordinary old man. He claimed to be 30, but it was pretty obvious that he was lying. And he was an insensitive man. And no one really liked him. One time in class, I forgot what we were talking about, but my professor innocently exposed him on accident. Huh? You're 42, right? It was on your papers. I remember because you're the same age as my younger sister. He seemed confused as he pointed this out to Timothy, and that's how we all found out that he was lying about his age. Well, no one believed that he was 30 anyways, so we weren't very surprised. Everyone was just like, we knew it. <laughs> Timothy tried to deny it, but... Oh, because my sister is 42 also. Wait, sorry. Was it a secret that you're so much older than everyone else? My professor kept pressing him with a straight face until Timothy finally admitted it. Timothy looked really upset that the professor exposed him and was glaring at him that entire day. But honestly, it's not like any of us were surprised. We were just shocked at his immature overreaction. Timothy was obviously out of his mind. When he found out about a guy that married a woman around his same age in his late 30s, he insulted him and called
from a loser who married an old hag. Timothy was a businessman until he entered our college and bragged about how his parents were paying his tuition. And everyone who heard that was taken aback. We were all confused at how this guy could think that it was okay for a 42-year-old to have his parents pay for his college education. But he apparently thought it was something to be proud of. What a crazy person. I'd never spoken to him personally, but I wanted to stay as far away from this guy as possible. Hey, you have a boyfriend? Timothy would go around hitting on college girls and stare at his favorite girls' bodies with a creepy smile on his face. He never actually put his hands on anyone, but he would pretend to touch their breasts and butts. Everyone was creeped out by him. I would go as far as to say that he had the eyes of a pedophile. He would also bring snacks to his favorite girls, too. You may have imagined baked goods from a famous bakery or something that you line up for, but they were like the cheapest snacks that you could buy at a grocery store that Timothy bought. I mean, nothing against grocery store snacks, but there was even something off about the whole concept of giving gifts, even. It may have been at least a little exciting to receive a cupcake from a famous cupcake bakery, but it was almost impressive how he could hand a girl a cheap cupcake from a grocery store and act like he was a gentleman. Girls would refuse, saying that they were cutting back on sweets, but... Don't worry about it. Don't be shy like that. Everyone was always grossed out by his creepy smile. After that, if his favorite girls would get boyfriends, he would go nuts. After all I did for you. If there was a girl trying to buy a lunch ticket at the cafeteria. Yeah, I got this. And he would have that creepy, satisfied look on his face. By the way, the most expensive menu at our cafeteria was $5. If you ask me, it's nothing to act all smug about, and honestly, just creepy to have some old man pay for your lunch like that out of the blue. There was one time that this pretty European girl came as an exchange student, and I heard that she was creeped out when he tried to greet her with hugs and kisses. First of all, greeting people like that wasn't even part of her culture. And even if you were to greet someone with kisses, you would do it on the cheek. But apparently, he tried to kiss her on the lips. And if you thought that was creepy enough, when the girl refused, I heard he got angry and started using discriminatory language to yell at her. It seemed like Timothy was into young-looking, small and cute-looking girls that looked like middle school or high school girls. If he ever saw a college student who looked like one, he wasn't interested. I would never sleep with an old hag like that. He would insult them like that. Jeez, does this guy even see himself? If he was ever rejected by the girl that he had his eyes on at the time... Aw, oh, come on! We're classmates, you and I! That's what he would try to say to convince them. Our faculty didn't have many students and had a very low ratio of males, so the PE classes were mixed. We stretched in pairs and it would require touching the other person, so it was normal for guys to pair up with other guys and girls to pair up with other girls. But one day, Timothy started saying that he wanted to pair up with a girl. It was the creepiest request ever. Everyone knew that he just wanted an excuse to touch another girl's body, so obviously no one wanted to pair up with him. This angered Timothy. Hey, this is school! One of you's required to pair up with me. The PE teacher was younger than Timothy. You can stretch with me or find another guy to pair up with. Your choice. The teacher could tell that Timothy had bad intentions. He understood that it wasn't safe to let him pair up with one of the girls. After being yelled at by the teacher... You old fart! He yelled back and stopped coming to this PE class. The girls were very thankful for the teacher, though. We were all glad that he decided to stop coming. After this incident, our school changed its policy and separated the men and women PE classes starting next semester. The girls took PE classes with their faculty, and the guys had combined classes. Timothy never even looked at the other guys in his class, and it was obvious how mean he was to the girls in his class who had boyfriends. I don't think Timothy planned to ever befriend any of the boys. He was warned a couple of times by various teachers, but he never stopped. In fact, he just kept escalating. 
He started attacking the boys with girlfriends and started trying to get even closer with the girls. One such day, Timothy volunteered to be in charge of open campus, and he started hitting on one of the high school girls that came to check out the college. She must have been exactly Timothy's type. You have a boyfriend? She didn't, so he got excited and found her high school and went to see her. That was enough to call him a stalker, but he approached her and tried to force her into a room by himself, saying that he wanted oh. to explain to her how good the college was. Luckily, her friend was there to save her. But he couldn't give up on her and found out where she worked and followed her around until finally the police got involved. What's worse, he was telling the people around her that they had met at an open campus and were dating now. He was lying that he was her boyfriend. He was using that as an excuse to collect information on her, but it was pretty obvious how old he was. It probably would have made more sense if he had introduced himself as a professor rather than a student. So rumors spread pretty quickly, and the girl found out and got the police involved. She filed a complaint, and Timothy was arrested. After his arrest, he must have finally felt like he lost his place in the college because he shut himself in his parents' house and stopped coming. There are many people in college from different backgrounds, and it's not out of the ordinary for someone to quit. Usually, something like this wasn't much of a topic, but when Timothy left, we were all excited for a while. We all celebrated for a while. Timothy had a very short temper, so not everyone could come forward while he was still there. But many girls came forward saying how he showed up to their houses when they were having girls' nights. Timothy was gone now, but the rumor is that the police have received multiple reports like the high school girl's case. My husband Jack's parents and my own parents were toxic parents that didn't care about their children seeing them fight every day. So when we got married, we promised each other that we wouldn't turn up like that and promised each other that we'd do whatever it takes to get along with each other. I was raised in a household filled with verbal and physical abuse. I was traumatized. When I see couples arguing on TV, I get depressed and start crying. Of course, I got in arguments with Jack, but we would never yell at each other or hit each other or pointlessly argue on. Most of the time, we would calmly get mad at each other and reflect on ourselves to fix our own shortcomings. So we got along very well. My parents and in-laws didn't like that though. My in-laws would bully me and my parents would bully Jack and try to make us fight with each other. Normally, you'd expect parents to be happy if their children were getting along with their spouses, right? But not our parents. They were all out of their minds. I tried to figure out why with Jack, but the best answer we could think of was that maybe they wanted to confirm that their way of life, arguing every day, was right. We tried our best to ignore them at first, but gradually both our parents started crossing the line. My mother lied to Jack that I was complaining that he didn't make enough money and tried to get us to fight with each other. Neither of us fell for their lies, of course, but we were both sick and tired of our parents trying to feed us lies. So we came up with a plan to get some revenge. Nothing extreme, of course. We just did the exact opposite of what they were doing to us. I went to Jack's mother, Tammy, first. Your husband told me how he's so grateful for everything you do for him and how he's always so regretful after he argues with you. He's a traditional man, as you know, so I think he's just having a hard time apologizing to you and showing his affection towards you. He always tells me how sorry he is about going hard on you. Then I went to her husband, Aaron. Tammy is a prideful woman, so I know she's always so stubborn with you. But when you're not around, she always talks so highly of you and tells everyone how she wishes she could go on dates with you. But she seemed sad saying that you're getting old, so you might not want to go out with her anymore. These were all complete lies, of course. Jack said the exact same sort of thing to my parents. They were such simple lies, and we figured that they would find out soon enough. But if they tried to scold us for lying, we were planning on just telling them that they were the ones that lied to us first. But funny enough, my in-laws started acting all awkward around each other after that. All they had done was argue until then, 
so they didn't know how to interact after finding out that the other person cared so much about them. I had been visiting my in-laws quite often to check up on how they were doing after my lies, and noticed that they were gradually changing. To my surprise, Aaron invited Tammy out for a stroll to the park. Tammy was surprised. He was having a hard time expressing his love, so maybe this is him trying to be… loving? She interpreted it like that and accepted his offer with an open mind. Since she accepted his offer so smoothly, Aaron took it as a sign that it was true that Tammy wanted to go on a date with him. Days passed like that and my in-laws started softening up and I saw them having fun conversations more often. They did find out midway that everything I told them was a lie, but by that time, they were already getting along so perfectly well. Rather than getting angry at the lie, they looked back on their lies that they told us and were embarrassed with themselves. They called us over to apologize one day. We're sorry for lying to you guys like that. Please forgive us. They seemed sincerely sorry, and I noticed Jack shedding a tear next to me. It means so much for a child to see their parents getting along. It was supposed to be payback for the lies to pull us apart. And we never expected this kind of outcome. Especially for Jack, who had only seen his parents fight for all these years. It was a very touching turn of events. Around the same time, my parents had caught on as well. Our plan wasn't working as well on them, but when my in-laws apologized to us, I explained to them that we were doing the same thing with my parents as well. And they happily cooperated with us. We know how it is to always be arguing. It was funny how enthusiastic they were about participating in the plan. This was their plan. It's normal these days for in-laws to be deeply in love. It's so uncool not to be flirting with each other. It was a simple seed that they planted. All they had to do was show them how well they got along now. Times have changed. Every couple is taking walks together now and expressing their love for each other straightforward. You know those couples you see on TV nowadays. That's how they all are, right? Tammy brought up examples of celebrities and was able to sympathize with my mother because they were both women raised in the same era. Life becomes so much more vibrant when you get along. It's like your high school years all over again, honey. Tammy kept feeding my mother this kind of narrative. It never worked when Jack or I said anything, but since they were around the same age, even though she was a little hesitant at first, my mother was completely all ears and would enjoy her conversations with Tammy. My father and Jack's father both shared golf as a common hobby, and when they would go together, Aaron would tell him how he never got along with Tammy for a long time, but life got so much better after they did. Jack and I kept feeding the fire. We told my father how hard my mother had been working around the house for him and told my mother how hard my father had been working for her. We continued on like that for a few months and one day my parents invited us over. When we got there, it was quite different than with Jack's parents. They didn't even look at each other. And Jack and I were thinking the same thing. Oh, looks like it didn't work with my parents. After seeing how Jack's parents had gotten along, I was hoping for the same thing with my parents, but I was devastated to think that it didn't work out with them. But in the next moment, they apologized to us. They both figured that the other person would never say such a thing about them and confronted each other about the lies we told them, and they quickly figured out that we were lying to them. At first, they were angry that we lied to them. But it was true that they were envious about how well my in-laws got along and told each other that the lie that they told wasn't a lie at all and that they did really care about each other. After hearing that, I was so happy. I cried tears of joy. My parents seemed confused. Jack explained to them that I had always been distressed about their fighting ever since I was a kid. My parents apologized to me after hearing that. We should have been more thoughtful of you. We're sorry. We're also sorry for lying to you guys. Afterwards, we found out that they weren't looking at each other when we got there out of embarrassment. It was a relief and it made me happy to hear that. 
our parents who used to try so hard to break us apart now going on vacations together. Our mothers go out for lunch together often as well. The other day, we went to that restaurant that gets great reviews together. Oh, so the next restaurant you go to, I highly recommend the one by the train station. They talk about their dates with their husbands and exchange information with each other. And they bug us now about something completely different. When are you guys having a baby? I can't wait for a grandchild. Our parents even bought us tickets for an overseas vacation as a gift. All right, guys, no fighting, okay? Take good care of each other. They're the ones reminding us to get along now. Neither of us expected to ever see our parents getting along. It's quite a mysterious sensation. But most importantly, they aren't trying to instigate fights anymore. Since they spent so many years at each other's throats, now they really enjoy getting along with each other. I gave birth the same year as my sister-in-law, Karen. It was the first two grandchildren that my in-laws had, and they were both girls and we lived nearby. And after they were born, my mother-in-law, Rose, completely changed. We had a good relationship until then, but she started only caring about Karen. She would treat me like a slave saying that Karen was having a hard time. I tried telling Rose that I was in the exact same situation as Karen, but Rose didn't listen. If I ever tried to refuse anything, she wouldn't even treat me like a human being. Rose would come over often to see her granddaughter and take diapers and other baby goods without permission and bring them to Karen. When she would find baby milk that I prepared in advance for my baby, Oh, perfect! This will help Karen save some time! She would take that too. As if that wasn't bad enough, she would take the clothes that my parents sent for their granddaughter and comfortable room wear for me and bring that to Karen as well. I voiced my concerns to my husband, Brian, and he was angry. We complained to Rose together, but she didn't seem sorry at all. Oh my, I'm so sorry. Cut me some slack here. I'm just worried about Karen. Emma's fine, right? Her apologies were insincere, and I could tell by the attitude that she didn't feel bad at all. Then, Karen started showing up and leaving her daughter at our house, saying that she wanted time alone with her husband. When we refused, somehow Rose would find out. Karen needs time to relax! How do you plan to take responsibility if her marriage doesn't work out? She would yell at me and make me do all of her housework while she was out with her husband for dinner and even prepare their breakfast for the next morning too. Brian told me that I didn't have to go, so I didn't do that, but I love children and I felt bad for my niece, so I did watch her from time to time. But Karen and Rose kept taking advantage of my love for my niece, and I was about to explode. But I had a better idea. I continued to watch over my niece, Amanda, for over 10 years. Thankfully, she was such a nice and brilliant girl, and got along well with my daughter. They fought now and then, but that's how little girls are. I changed her diapers, helped her prepare for preschool, sewed her PE clothes for her when she got into elementary school, prepared her lunches, and drove her to and from after school activities. Karen was happy that I did all of this for her. She just kept forcing things on me so she could have an easy time. I went shopping for clothes with my daughter and Amanda and did her hair for her. When she was old enough to start liking boys, I listened to her and gave her advice. As Amanda hit puberty, there were so many changes in her body that confused her, but I taught her everything I knew and poured my heart into raising her as my own. As you'd expect, Amanda loved me wholeheartedly too. Brian looked after his niece as well. Karen was always prioritizing herself, so he loved Amanda and scolded her just like her own daughter. We even brought Amanda with us on our family vacations. She was in every family photo we took, but she was already family to us. Since we fed and bought things for Amanda, Karen spent all of her money on herself. She was excited that her daughter wasn't costing her any money. And she spent all the free time she had hanging out with her friends. As a result, Amanda showed me respect and stopped listening to Karen altogether. Amanda got great grades and was very cute, so Karen would try to show her off, but Amanda didn't listen to her at all. I would see Karen yelling at Amanda, but she couldn't get through to her. But when I would scold her, she would straighten up as if she was being yelled by her own mother. By the time Karen realized what was going on, Amanda was treating her like a stranger. 
Karen was Amanda's mother, but didn't know the first thing about her. She had no idea what Amanda liked to eat, when her new teeth grew in, or about her periods. But I knew everything. Amanda was such a respectable young woman, but Karen and Rose were disappointed that she didn't want anything to do with them. One day, when Amanda was relaxing at my house as usual, Rose, Karen, and her husband came over suddenly. You brainwashed my daughter! Give her back to me! Karen started complaining about the situation. Well, it was Emma that raised me. I've never even eaten your food, Mom. Amanda told them. Karen's husband was shocked to hear this. He was a busy man and barely spent any time at home. Karen took advantage of the situation and was doing as she pleased behind his back. But all the while, she was telling her husband that she was being a perfect mother and didn't even mention how I was involved at all. She kept it hidden from him all this time. He was shocked to find out that I had bought Amanda her bags for preschool and elementary school and had paid for her school uniforms as well. They got in a heated argument after that. Karen tried to say that it was my selfish decision, but her husband didn't buy it. She wanted all the credit, now that Amanda had grown into such a capable young girl and was trying so hard with Rose to get Amanda back, but it was way too late for amends. Rose did love my daughter equally, and Karen did love Amanda like someone would love their pet cat. But neither of them actually raised her or took care of her. They just praised her and played with her when they felt like it. Karen would kiss up to Amanda when she would take her out to show her off. But that just made Amanda hate her even more. We never cared how smart or beautiful Amanda was. She was family to us, and that's all that mattered. So, Amanda had never argued with her mother, let alone have a proper conversation with her. But I would scold Amanda just like my own daughter if she ever did anything wrong. We were both girls, so we did have fights now and then, but each fight just strengthened our bond. I guess kids love the person who makes them their food. I told Karen and Rose that it wasn't too late to take care of Amanda, but they didn't want to start caring for her as an adolescent. So they just planned to wait until Amanda grows up to reconnect with her. It sounded stupid that they would think that they could reconnect if Amanda was older. But Amanda was uninterested in them already, so whatever. Amanda ended up going to a private high school with a dormitory and became independent after she graduated. Karen and Rose haven't been able to reconnect with her to this day. I received a call from Amanda the other day. She told me how she found a job and is living a happy life now. After we small talked for a while, Amanda's voice became serious. There is something important I need to tell you. I asked her what it was, and she told me that she was planning on getting married to the guy that she was currently dating, and that she wanted me to meet her fiancé. I was surprised to hear that, and I double-checked if I was the one fit for that role. Well, I don't know what everyone else thinks, but to me, you're my mother, Emma. I gripped my phone tightly as tears ran down my cheeks. Later, Amanda stopped by with her fiancé and introduced him to me and Brian. This is my mom and dad. We were surprised at the introduction, but it seemed like the fiancé had heard about Amanda's situation from her. They held a wonderful wedding, but I never saw Karen or Rose there. After the wedding was over, they found out about it and came rushing over to my house. Why were we invited to my own daughter's wedding? I am her mother, and this is her grandmother! That just made me snap, and I went off on them. You call yourself a mother? Tell me the last time you did something motherly for her. When I agreed to take care of her when she was a baby, you just took advantage of me and selfishly went out and did whatever you wanted. Is that what a mother does? I was the one that raised Amanda. And you, Rose. Amanda was watching you bullying me and only caring about Karen the entire time. They didn't have the words to argue back. Amanda isn't a doll or a pet that you guys can just brag about when you feel like it. Someone had to care for her to become a respectable adult, and it was me and Brian that did that. They knew that they were in the wrong, so they left without even trying to argue back. Karen's husband was fed up with her as well and ended up filing for divorce. Amanda and I still keep in touch. Karen was all alone now, but looking back on what she did, it serves her right. 
I raised Amanda as my own, and I think of her as my daughter now. That will never change. A few weeks ago, I went out with my three-year-old daughter Ali to go shopping for her birthday present. She wanted a Hello Kitty blouse. She loves Hello Kitty. So I bought it for her. She seemed really excited. Let's go home. I want to try it out. So we went back home. She changed into her new outfit and danced in front of me. She spent hours in front of the mirror. That evening, I had a PTA meeting for my older daughter at her cram school. Ali said she wanted to come too. She wanted to show off her new outfit, so I said yes. There was a kid's space there, and there was always someone on watch during the PTA meetings. That day, an older sister of a student was on watch. We started the meeting. Five minutes later, some of the kids came into the room and said, Hey, Ali says she's cold. I went to check on her, and she was in her underwear. I couldn't believe my eyes. The old girl came over to me and said, I'm sorry. She apologized to me. According to her, some lady came up to her and said, Oh dear, you got a big stain on your shirt. Here, let me clean it up for you. Then she took her clothes and ran off. I thought it was her mother, so I didn't say anything. When I realized that it wasn't her mom, it was too late. I'm so sorry. The older girl started crying. But it wasn't her fault. She's my daughter. I should have been more careful. So I told her not to worry and apologize too. Don't worry, dear. It's not your fault. I'm sorry you had to go through all that. After a while, she stopped crying. I looked around the kids' area, but couldn't find the blouse. Hello Kitty! My Hello Kitty! My daughter was so upset. I borrowed some clothes from one of the moms there and took her home. I'll start looking for that woman tomorrow. For now, I'm gonna focus on making my daughter feel better. It's okay, dear. I'll get you another one, okay? A few days later, we went out shopping again. Then... Hello Kitty! She started pointing at a girl. There was a girl sitting next to the ice cream stand. She was wearing that same blouse I bought for my daughter a few days ago. The place had lots of Hello Kitty clothes, so I didn't think much of it. But then I noticed something. When I got her that outfit, I put a patch on the back. I made the patch myself, so it was no coincidence. She was wearing my daughter's blouse. I had more than enough proof. Hey dear, where's your mother? I asked the girl. She pointed towards the ice cream shop. It was one of my daughter's teachers from the cram school. I went up to her and said, Hey, you stole my daughter's outfit, didn't you? She seemed surprised, but then she replied, What? I have no idea what you're talking about. I bought it here. How could you accuse me like this? Nope, you stole it. I got proof. See this patch? I put it on myself. We started arguing in the middle of the store. Her husband was with her. He had no idea what was going on. No matter what I said to her, she just kept saying that she bought it herself. But then, she started saying that the patch was there when she bought it. I got her now. I actually wrote my daughter's name on the back of the patch. So I took off the patch and showed it to her. She was speechless. What now? How did my daughter's name end up here? I know. Let's go back to the clothes store and take a look. I came here today to buy her a new one anyways because of you. Thief. She couldn't say anything back to me. But I couldn't just take off her clothes in the middle of the store. So we went back to our home once. The next day, her husband called me. He asked me and my husband to come over to their house. I asked my parents to watch the kids for me and headed over there. 
Her husband looked pretty tough, but he was actually very polite. He offered to pay us double for the clothes his wife stole. Then... We'll pay for all the damages. He started crying as he apologized. It wasn't his fault, and he was apologizing, so I said okay. After coming home, I called the school and told them what happened. The lady at the cram school couldn't believe it. They thought I was making it up. They didn't even apologize. Can you believe them? So, you're calling me a liar? If you don't believe me, I'll send you a copy of her written confession. Also, I don't want my daughter going to your cram school anymore. Then, I hung up with the phone. A few days later, I got an official apology from the cram school. After getting my call, they looked into that lady in question. Turns out she stole things from her students all the time. In fact, that's why she got fired from her last job. But she used her maiden name to apply for her current job. That's why they didn't notice. And since she worked there, she had no trouble sneaking into the PTA meeting. The school called me back and apologized about not believing me at first. That's nice to hear, but my daughter isn't going back there. Then I hung up the phone. I might have been a bit rude, but one of their teachers stole my daughter's clothes. And they accused me of lying? I don't think so. Anyways, I felt bad for my daughter, so I got her a new one. And a Hello Kitty pajama to make her feel better. Hello Kitty! <laughs> Hello Kitty! Now, she could wear Hello Kitty during the day and night. As for my older daughter, I felt bad for pulling her out of cram school since she had friends there. But at the new place, she ran into a good friend from school. So I guess it all worked out. As for the teacher, her husband found out about everything. I heard that they were getting a divorce soon. Looks like she's gonna try to fight it, but I don't think it's gonna work. Her husband was furious with her for what she did and how she did it. And the judge felt the same way. She was basically screwed. She had no choice but to sign the papers. She's not fit to be a mother, so there's no doubt about that. Her daughter was still young, but can you imagine what she had to go through? Finding out that the clothes her mother gave her were stolen? Poor girl. And her husband must be so upset too. Who wouldn't be, right? Oh well, I don't really care about what happens to her. But her husband seemed like a decent person. Let's just hope things work out for him and his daughter. This is my younger brother's epic story. My grandfather had two children, my father and my uncle. My uncle Jerry didn't have any sons, just two daughters. And in my family, I have one younger brother. My grandfather was the fourth generation family line of business owners in the countryside. His company went public after the Second World War. He was the chairman, and my uncle was the CEO. It was a mid-sized family-run business with sloppy accounting. My grandfather and uncle had a strong belief that the eldest son should inherit everything and were male chauvinists who only believed in family. Uncle Jerry didn't have a son, so they had decided amongst themselves to make my younger brother Gary marry my uncle's eldest daughter Melinda and make Gary inherit the company. My father had been trained to follow orders ever since he was a child, so he didn't argue about it at all. Uncle Jerry was unfairly mean to his wife and would always insult her. He treated her as if she was a useless slave because she wasn't able to bear a son for them. Auntie Jane was human too after all, so she would secretly cry and complain about Jerry. But she knew better than to fight him because she knew that nothing would change either way. My mother got it a little better than Jane because she was able to have my brother, but it seems that she was often told to sleep with Jerry and to have a boy for him. <sighs> what a bunch of psychopaths, right? <laughs> Gary was treated like a king because he was the only boy in the family. The grandchildren were all ranked as well, and I was at the bottom of the pyramid. On special occasions, Gary and Melinda were the only ones who got to eat the good stuff. And when we would order sushi, Gary would get the expensive ones and I would get the cheap leftovers. This kind of discrimination was so normal ever since we were small children. So I numbed myself to it early on and grew up feeling that it was normal. Gary was easily influenced like my father, so he never really questioned his position either and just acted like it was normal. It was such a toxic environment for me. 
So I left as soon as I graduated high school and moved into the city. I kept my distance from my brother and other relatives, including my parents. Living alone was great. All of my complex relationships and constraints dissolved. And I was happy to finally be living a peaceful life. A few years later, my grandfather turned 80, the same year that Gary turned 20, and decided to retire. So he invited the employees at his company along with all of our relatives to celebrate. According to my mother, my grandfather and uncle had decided on their own to announce Gary and Melinda's engagement and Gary's new position as CEO at the party. Of course, Melinda wasn't asked what she wanted, and I could never tell what Gary was thinking anyways. I was not planning on going, but Melinda called me up and asked me to come. I wanted to ask her how she felt about marrying my brother, but part of me was scared to know her true feelings and be devastated for her. My grandfather also insisted that every family member had to be there, and I was able to get that day off work, so I went. Honestly, part of me was going for the thrill as well. They rented the biggest hotel venue in town that day. My grandfather and uncle were using my aunt and mother like servants that day as well. Gary was running a little late, so Melinda and I ran around serving drinks to people. I've been away from all this family business for a while now, so even though it was a one-time thing, it was pretty annoying to be used like that. So Melinda and I just continued to entertain the guests while my mother and Aunt Jane hustled behind the scenes. After a while, Melinda changed into a nice dress and sat next to her father. Yeah, let the woman serve you your drinks, everyone. They can get on their knees while they're at it, am I right? <laughs> I felt like I could stab Uncle Jerry for his disgusting jokes. I was getting sick that this was Melinda's father, and soon to be my little brother's father-in-law. He must have been feeling like his life was set now that his daughter was marrying Gary. He was in a great mood, and his drinks flowed. About an hour in, as people were loosening up, Gary finally arrived. My grandfather and uncle stood up and were preparing to announce the engagement as they waited for Gary to enter the room. Then suddenly, Gary appeared in a white dress and beautiful makeup. Commotion spread throughout the room and chaos followed. Beer was spewing out of some of the guests' mouths as well. My mother and aunt dropped the glasses that they had in their hands and stood there in awe. My father was panicking and looked like he was about to foam from the mouth. After a moment of silence, Gary finally spoke. I'll be Melinda's new wife soon. I won't be able to have a child, but I'll obey everything you say, Uncle Jerry. Please take me as your daughter. There was another moment of silence. Then... Are you kidding us? What the hell? My grandfather and uncle's cries filled the room. My father was still panicking, and the guests were confused. It was just pure chaos in that room. I had been away from home for a while and hadn't stayed in close touch with Gary, so it was quite shocking to find out that he was on that side of the spectrum. My mother and Aunt Jane were shocked because Gary had never expressed that side of himself before. They just looked at each other, shook their heads, and stared back at Gary in disbelief. Some guests went over to hold back my grandfather and Uncle Jerry who were still yelling at Gary. And then the whole party was called off. Everyone left without any time to even say goodbye. No way they could announce their children's engagement. It was a complete disaster. It was a small countryside town, and none of the guests had ever seen a transgender before, so the rumors spread like wildfire. The rumors sparked new rumors, and people started rumoring that Uncle Jerry might have been sexually abusing Gary and things like that. They quickly became the talk of the town, and their business tumbled downhill. A year later, they had to shut down their business. Apparently, Gary hadn't thought much of everything that was going on around him while he was growing up, but once he got into college and started making friends, he realized how unusual it was for him to be treated like that by his relatives. After giving it some thought, Gary wanted to ruin their plans and had planned everything with Belinda starting six months ago. They had to think of a good and legal way to do the most damage and thought of this plan. 
They were the only two who knew about the plan. They asked one of Melinda's beautician friends to help and went out to rent a real wedding dress for the occasion and shaved all of Gary's body hair as well. They thoroughly planned for that day. <laughs> it was Gary who thought of the plan, but I was surprised to find out Melinda was in on it too. That day, she sat next to her father and poured drinks to the guests without even a hint that she had been in on it. Gary's acting was pretty on point too. But Melinda's poker face was quite amazing as well. My grandfather did not feel well after that and is kind of out of it recently. My uncle had shut himself in, so the ladies were free from their opposition. I felt a little bad that the family business fell apart because of the incident, but my mother and aunt weren't disappointed about it at all. They were furious at first when they found out Gary and Melinda planned such a thing, but in the end, they had some weight lifted off their shoulders after they saw that the men got what they deserved. They were treated like slaves at home until then. But after the incident, they were able to get part-time jobs. And after decades of being secluded from society, they were excited about their freedom and were now filled with life compared to the men who lost all of theirs. Now that they have found their place in the world, they've become much happier and positive people. I'm glad that they don't complain half as much as they used to. I felt the same sort of relief when I started living alone, so I could really sympathize with how they must feel now. On top of everything, things were complicated for a while, but Melinda and Gary got much closer after the incident, and they really ended up getting married. Part of me thought that if they were going to get married anyways, th that they didn't have to ruin the marriage announcement in the first place. But it was because of that whole prank that they got closer, so I guess things are a little more complicated than that. They had a baby boy after that. If my grandfather and uncle were still sane, they probably would have been very excited about it. Gary and Melinda didn't plan to raise their son in the same toxic environment that they were raised in. After everything they did, I was relieved to hear how normal their minds were. I hated my hometown after everything that I went through as a child. But now I have a cute nephew back home and a new sister-in-law. My mother and aunt are happier now too, so I'm excited to go back once in a while. My older brother passed when he was still in his 30s. The last time I saw him was about six months before he passed away. One day, things will start going your way, so just stick to it. Those were his last words. Yeah, I hope so. Life isn't that simple though. At the time, I didn't know about his illness or that he already knew he only had a limited time left. I was complaining to him about how I was thinking about getting a divorce without any clue about any of that. A year into my marriage, I bought a house with my husband Jeff. We split the loan half and half, and we planned to have at least two children, so we built a house big enough to accommodate two more kids. But later we found out that he was infertile. At the time though, I wasn't worried about it. Jeff wasn't the type of guy who would cheat on me, and I figured I would just live happily together with him. Things started going sideways after his sister, Angela, who was divorced, started spending the night often at our place. Our house was close to Angela's work, and she started using one of our empty rooms as if it was her own. I had my off-season clothes and other things stored in that room, so it wasn't exactly empty. It was more like storage space, but it gradually got filled with Angela's personal belongings. What's all this? She didn't get the message. Oh, those are mine. That's all she would say. Then she started telling me how all the things in that room were in her way and that she didn't have enough room to put her own things. I tried discussing it with Jeff, but it was pointless. Any time that she worked overtime or had drinks after work, she would sleep at our house and go to work from there the next day. We had AC in all the rooms, but Angela didn't care about our electricity bills. She would put the AC on full blast and our bills skyrocketed. Jeff and I didn't have many hobbies, but we both loved to drink beer. We always had a stock of beer in the fridge, but whenever Angela would come over, she would drink as much as she wanted and empty up the fridge and just leave the empty cans lying around in her room. She would eat anything she wanted in our pantries and tell me to stock up more. This is almost gone. Go buy some while you're at the store. After Jeff and I would take a bath, I always cleaned the bathtub, but 
Angela would fill it up and leave it filled and just leave. She never helped clean the house, wash the dishes, or clean the bathtub even once. Basically, she would drink and eat what she wanted, make a mess, and leave. I was starting to get quite fed up with her. I tried talking to Jeff about it many times, but for some reason, Jeff couldn't really stand up to Angela and couldn't tell her off no matter how many times I begged him to. That dynamic just made Angela get worse. At first, it was only one or two times a month, but gradually, she started coming more. Since she started coming over, her heating bills, food bills, and alcohol money went down dramatically, and she started coming over more and more whenever she wanted. One day, I was supposed to go on a picnic with some co-workers and friends. I prepared some food for that day, and when I wasn't looking, she stole a bunch of it. I was out running errands for our neighborhood watch, and Jeff saw her stealing it, but didn't even say anything. That made me angry, and I got in a heated argument with Jeff, and gradually, our marriage started falling apart. I was ready to get divorced, but at the same time, it seemed stupid when I thought that I was getting divorced because of Angela. But Jeff was so weak, I was confused about what I was to do. And that's how I ended up consulting my older brother. My brother passed away shortly after that, and he left everything for me to inherit. That's when his words finally made sense to me. My parents were still alive, and I wasn't sure of the legalities, but everything including his life insurance was signed over to me. My brother had told my parents about it before he passed away. Think of it as a gift from your brother, and you live a happy life for him too. My parents were understanding of the situation. I was surprised that my brother had left everything for me, but more than that, I was so sad about my brother's loss and cried for many days after that. I wonder how he felt when he was listening to me, knowing that he wouldn't be around for much longer. It really made me sad to think about these things. I kept my brother's will and the insurance money a secret from Jeff. I was already pretty set on divorce, and I didn't want him, or especially Angela, to find out. There was no way I was going to let her have anything to do with that money that my brother left for me. After receiving the insurance money, I put it in my bank and had my parents hold on to my bank card. I would be okay for a while even if I got divorced, so I gradually started moving in that direction. It was interesting how a little bit of financial stability can lift a lot of weight off one's shoulders. I was thinking about the right time to break it to Jeff when... Maybe I'll just move in. Angela said, as she was relaxing on my sofa one day. I'll pay you $300 a month for rent. How's that? I mean, it is kind of weird to ask your own sister to pay, but Katie would probably get on your case if I didn't. So, whatever. That was a pretty annoying statement, but I sat there and waited for Jeff's response. Hmm. I could tell that he was looking at me for answers as he pretended to think about it. I knew that Jeff didn't want her to live there, but he didn't have the balls to say it himself, and I could tell that he wanted me to say no. So I asked Angela, All right, let's say you're paying $300 a month for rent. What about everything else? Huh? I mean, everything besides rent. You always drink a lot of beer and keep the AC on all day, right? And you've never paid a cent for all the food that you ate from our fridge without permission. But what about all of that? When I asked her that, she seemed upset. What the hell are you saying? I'm your sister-in-law. It's generous of me to even offer to pay rent. That's all I'm paying for. The rest is on you two. She came on strong. Well, I expected her to say that, but actually hearing it was pretty annoying. That's pretty much freeloading. How does it make sense for someone with a job to pay $300 for rent and expect us to pay all of your other expenses? Where's your common sense? Shut up! I'm Jeff's older sister. I looked over at Jeff while we were arguing, but he seemed like he didn't want to get involved. He just sat there expecting us to duke it out like a little girl. And I had had enough. Well, you guys can have fun discussing it. I'm out of here. I want a divorce, Jeff. But what should we do about this house? I mean, half of it does belong to me, right? I left it at that, gathered my things, and walked out. Jeff and Angela both looked awestruck. I can still remember their faces. Jeff tried to talk me out of it for a long time, but after I told him that we could argue about it forever, 
that my mind was set? He finally gave up and signed the papers. We split our assets fairly, including the house. Angela said that she would help pay the loan and wanted to keep the house. But Jeff finally realized that was Angela that destroyed our marriage and decided to get rid of the house and move somewhere far away from where Angela worked. On a side note, Jeff later got remarried to another woman, who was also infertile, after sympathizing about their similar circumstances. And I also got remarried and have children now. It's a bit ironic to think about how it was thanks to Angela ruining my marriage that I was able to have children, but honestly, I had given up on children, so I was very happy to have some now. Jeff and I had moved on, but Angela was still alone. She was getting too old now, and although she hasn't given up yet, with that personality, she'll probably have a hard time finding someone. It wasn't like I divorced Jeff out of spite, so when he told me about his new marriage, I was happy for him. If Jeff had been stricter towards Angela back then, things could have been very different. Life takes many unexpected turns, but I am grateful for my family that I have now. And it seems like Jeff is happy too. Deep down, I'm kind of happy that Angela's having a hard time after all the trouble she caused for us. It's thanks to my brother that I'm happy today. He's not here with me anymore, but he will forever be my one and only brother. And I will forever be grateful to him. How was today's video? If you enjoyed it, please subscribe, like, and leave a comment. Stay tuned for more.